In this lecture, we're gonna focus on the kinematics of circular motion, especially uniform circular motion. The uh, importance of circular motion is it is prevalence. It's because circular motion really is everywhere, right? And uh, you know, the earth, for example, moves in near circle around the sun. And um, we, every person on the surface of the earth also moves in a big circle um, because the earth spins about its axis. And uh, there are many, many other examples of circular motion. Um, when you drive, you know, uh, the, the tires, um, they're, they're turning in circles and so on. There's so many examples. And uh, what we do now is we're gonna focus on the kinematics of circular motion. And that is, we're gonna look at specifically the acceleration, what it takes to move in a circle. It certainly takes an acceleration because at least the direction of motion is changing. Right now, um, we can take a look at this diagram that we initially saw um, in our first lecture in chapter four, and that is we we broke down the uh, acceleration along two directions. One is parallel to the direction of motion; the other is perpendicular to the direction of motion. Um, here, in this case, the velocity let's say the velocity points this way. Okay, it moves in a circle. The velocity points this way. This is v. And uh, we can, again, break down the acceleration into two components, one along the direction of motion, the other perpendicular to it. Uh, we call it a tangential for the component that's parallel to the velocity and a perp for the component that's perpendicular to the, to the direction of the velocity. But since we now consider only circular motion, when you look at this component that's perpendicular to the direction of motion, clearly it's pointing to the center of the circle. Okay, now we saw the uh, physics uh, of, uh, of breaking down this acceleration into these two components. The one that's parallel to the velocity is responsible for the change in the speed. And the one that is perpendicular to direction motion is responsible to change for the change in the direction of motion. Okay, so you recall, uh, we found that the component uh, uh, along the direction of motion, A perp, or in this case, we call it A sub R, is really the same thing. Um, a r or, or a parallel to direction of motion that is equal to dv dt v here is the speed okay the speed so i'm gonna write that down now a parallel equals to dv dt so if the speed doesn't change, we're looking at what's called uniform circular motion, then um, there's no component along the direction of motion. But no matter what, as long as it moves in a circle, you definitely would need the other component. That is, there has to be a component of the acceleration pointing to the center of the circle, because that's what it takes to turn the thing around. If there's no such an acceleration, the thing will move in a straight line, not in a circle. Okay, uh, so that's A, C. Here, this term, this subscript C, C here stand for Centripetal. Centripetal means what? Center seeking. Okay, because it points to the center of the circle, point O. Centripetal acceleration. So, what we want to do here is to derive the expression for the centripetal acceleration. Now, we know it depends on the speed, it also depends on the radius, right? Those are the parameters we'll be using. Um, before we set out to do a derivation, in fact, we'll be deriving it in two different ways. Let's take a good guess as what the answer should be. You know, it's a function of the speed as a function of the radius. Um, what kind of expression which contains the speed V and radius R that will give you the acceleration? Well, this in fact is a classic example of dimensional analysis, right? Um, A is in meters per second squared in SI system. But then I have R, which is in meters, R in meters. And then I have V in meters per second. So how does one combine R and V to get meters per second squared? Well, clearly you have to square V because this is the only term that contains second. You have to square that because, you know, it's squared in the expression for the acceleration. So we're gonna have to square that, okay? So when you do V squared, what do you get? The unit is meter squared over second squared. 
but the acceleration, there is only meters per second squared, not meters squared over second squared. So how do you get rid of that extra squared in meters? Well, you're gonna have to divide by R because R is in meters, right? Uh, so V squared over R will give you the correct dimension at least. So therefore, uh, the centripetal acceleration should be a constant times V squared over R. We call it a constant K. K is a number, okay? Could be equal to one, could be equal to two, could be equal to pi, who knows? And regardless, regardless of what K is, um, the centripetal acceleration has got to be proportional to V squared over R because that's the only dimensionally correct combination of V and R that will give you the acceleration in meters per second squared in SI unit. All right, that's one way to um, sort of take an educated guess at when, what the answer is. But there is another way to look at this. You think about it, okay? It, we don't have to just look at the dimension, we have to look at the actual physics. You know AC is due to the change in the direction of motion. And there are two parameters that will affect AC. One is V, the other is R. Now let's suppose we fix one of them. Let's fix V, okay? And let's change R. Um, if you move in the same, uh, with the same speed, but over a smaller circle, then you're gonna have to turn around uh, more frequently, right? Which means the direction of motion will change more frequently, right? Um, on the other hand, if you move about a really big circle like, like the Earth, it's gonna take you a very long time before you turn around and complete one turn because that's, that will be the circumference of the Earth. So therefore, the smaller the R, the greater the centripetal acceleration because that makes you turn around more frequently, therefore changing the direction of motion more frequently. And after all, AC is due to the change in the direction of motion. So it's gonna increase as R decreases. At the same time, if you fix R and increase V, so it goes faster, it turns around faster, therefore it's also gonna you know, change direction of motion more frequently if V increases. So clearly um, AC would go up with V and will go down with R. So you would express AC as something uh, like, something like V over R. That's the, you know, the easiest, simplest possible way, which will increase with V and decrease R. But you know, clearly that is not quite right because you're gonna mess, mess up the units. Uh, that will be meters per second for V divided by R, which is meters. So you just get one over second. So clearly that's not right, okay? So to get meters per second squared, we have to square that, right? So you, have to, you also have to use a little bit of a dimension analysis at the end to lock, to, to lock the, uh, the final expression up to a constant. But regardless, uh, this analysis tells you that from a physics point of view, uh, because of the nature of AC is due to the change in direction of motion, it's gonna increase with V and decrease with R. So you have a large speed moving along, uh, over a very small circle, you will be turning around very frequently, therefore AC will be large, okay? So that's the idea. Now, if V does not change, so there's no parallel component of the acceleration, parallel to direction of motion, then we call it uniform circular motion. In that case, you have only AC, which is responsible to change in a direction of motion. Now, next, let's settle down to find the exact expression for AC. We know it's something times V squared over R. What is that something equal to? Are we so lucky that constant K equals one in our case? Well, we're gonna find out, right? We're gonna find out. And there, uh, we're gonna use a couple of, of different methods to find the answer. All right, now this method uh, following this diagram, um, let's assume that you start with an initial position right here at the, uh, on the left side, on this big circle on the left side, you start from here, this point, we call it initial. Um, a little time delta T later, you arrive at a final point right there. That's final, okay. And uh, the um, position vector R went from the initial value to the final value, okay? And uh, it sweeps on an angle delta theta. In the meantime, let's look at the velocity vector, right? the velocity vector. You know, the velocity vector is always perpendicular to the radius vector because that's the you know, special nature of being a circle. So um, if the R vector, the displacement vector or position vector went from 
um, one direction to another direction with an angle delta theta in between. Then since V is always perpendicular to R, we know V also turns around at an angle delta theta, same angle. Okay, so the angle between V and, and, and initial and V final delta theta is the same, it's the same delta theta right here. Okay, and for simplicity, let, let's, let's assume that V doesn't change in magnitude. Okay, so we're looking at two isosceles triangles. Okay, one for, you know, one for this R and the other for V, okay, the other for V. Now, our job is to find the acceleration, which is delta V over delta T taking the limit of delta T approaching zero. So let's find delta V first with the assumption that we're looking at a very small time interval. Therefore, delta V is very short compared with V and the angle delta theta is extremely small. Okay, so let's do that. Um, we, have, we need to find what this delta theta is. Now, delta theta is the angle turned by the position vector. That has to do with how fast you move and also how long you, you can move from initial to final, okay? Uh, so if this thing moves, this, this object moves from initial to final, it moves along an arc. So let me use a different color for, for this arc here. This is the arc, all right? It went from initial to final along this arc. And the length of this arc, we call it delta S, delta S, right? Then clearly delta S equals two, R times delta theta. Right, that's the definition of delta theta is delta S over R. Now, if I take delta S over delta T, divided by the time it takes to complete this uh, motion, motion from initial to final, divided by delta T. We know R doesn't change, so divided by delta T. Okay, what is delta S over delta T? Isn't that a speed, right? And let's assume the speed doesn't change. So yeah, delta S over delta T is constant. We call it just, it's just the speed. Okay, so V equals R delta theta over delta T. Now, our job is to find delta theta so we can find the length delta V in this smaller triangle on the right side. And uh, strictly speaking, um, this is a triangle, but since we're looking at a very, very tiny angle here, so if, if, if imagine I draw a circle centered right here uh, with a radius of, which is equal to the speed V, and then that circle, uh, would produce an arc, okay, it would, it would produce an arc like this. And this arc is almost the same in length as this black vector delta V, which is a straight line, right? Because the angle theta is very small. Okay, so how long is this arc? Or well, the length of this red arc is equal to uh, V times delta theta, isn't it? V times delta theta. But wait a minute, I just said this length of the arc is almost the same as the length of delta V, which is a straight line. So this is roughly delta V, okay? This is valid when theta, when delta theta is very small. Now, I know what delta theta is. Delta theta is V times delta T over R from the first equation, the first equation. So here's the second equation, let me combine them. Okay, so then I get uh, uh, delta V equals to V times delta theta, delta theta again from the first equation is V delta T over R delta theta, okay? Uh, is, is delta theta is V delta T over R delta theta. V delta T over R actually, because I'm, I'm looking for delta theta, V delta T over R from equation number one. Okay, so that's V squared delta T over R. Now let's move delta T to the left hand side. Then I get delta V over delta T is roughly equal to V squared over R. This approximation becomes exact when the angle delta theta approaches zero. Okay, because that's when the arc lens here, this red arc lens coincides with this black vector here. Right? So, um, but that's when delta T approaches zero, so this becomes dvdt, so dvdt 
What is that equal to? That is exactly the same as v squared over one. Okay, now by the way, I should put an arrow here because uh, this is, we're not looking at the magnitude change. I'm assuming the magnitude V doesn't change. So looking for this, basically. This is, this is what I'm really getting, okay? So I'm looking at, what, what I'm getting is the magnitude of the acceleration AC. So therefore, I conclude that AC equals V squared over R. That's exactly we, what we suspected. We know it's something times V squared over R, right? Something times V squared over R, and that something turns out to be equal to one. So it's our lucky day. Okay, we have, we have a constant which equals one, this K simply equals one, okay? So we already saw, even before we arrived at this uh, conclusion through, the, uh, so, through some geometry, that it's gonna be something times V squared of R. It, it's, it, it makes sense dimensionally. It also makes sense physically. So now we have a complete understanding and a derivation of the centripetal acceleration. All right, now let's find this expression with a second method. So what do we do now is we are going to uh, use the orthodox way of finding r as a function of time first, the position vector of an object doing circular motion. And then we're gonna take a derivative to get v, and we take un yet another derivative to get a, okay? Assuming it's uniform circular motion, the speed doesn't change. So we have this particle here, okay? This particle right here, and it moves around a circle. I'm, I've, cho I've chosen a coordinate system um, the center of that coordinate system happens to be the center of the circle. So it's right here, point O. And uh, um, at a time t, the particle is right here and, uh, and the position vector r makes an angle theta with the x-axis. Now, if the thing moves at a constant rate, okay, so the speed doesn't change, and clearly the angle theta should also increase uniformly, right? Linearly as a function of time. So theta is a linear function of time and uh, so theta is proportional to time, right? At a constant of proportionality, we know theta is proportional to time. Assuming that th when, when, when t equals zero, uh, the, the, the particle is right here when t equals zero, which means theta would be equal to zero, okay? Now the constant of proportionality is called omega. You can see here, omega, okay? Uh, what is the meaning of omega? Well, if you look at x equals vt, okay, that's, that v is how fast x changes as a function of time, right? Here, theta equals omega t. So that omega is how fast theta changes as a function of time. And v is called linear speed or just speed, and therefore ang uh, omega should be called angular speed because that's how fast the angle theta changes, right? So omega is called angular speed. But you don't have to know that term. We're gonna, we're gonna visit that when it comes to rotation, but um, we might as well introduce the, 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 the concept here, uh, it's called angular speed. It's just how fast the angle theta changes. And it's a constant in our case, because the speed of the, of the circular motion is uniform. Okay, so what is omega equal to? Well, um, we know that if you, if this particle goes around one complete circle, the angle covered theta will be two pi. So, right? So consider one complete cycle, and then the angle covered would be two pi. And the time it takes to do that uh, is called a period of the circular motion, big T. So big T, the time it takes for the thing to turn around once. Okay, so uh, angle over time, that's omega. Okay, now that we know what omega is, consider the moment where the particle is, uh, you know, is the angular position is theta above the x-axis. So I can find the uh, x and y coordinate of this particle P, okay? So x equals two, as you can see, the radius is a constant, okay? We call it R and uh, it's cosine theta. Theta is a function of time. Similarly, y is R times sine theta. R doesn't change, but theta is a function of time, okay? So we start with this, and our job is to find the acceleration. We can just take a couple of derivatives, work it there. Okay, so V, that's the next thing we do. We find Vx and Vy, what's Vx? Vx is dx dt, right, isn't it? Dx dt. All right. And then um, R is a constant, so I'm gonna take, uh, leave that R as a constant and take a derivative for cosine theta, d dt of cosine theta. 
we all know what that is. That is negative R sine theta and then d theta dt. Wait a minute, what is d theta dt? That's how fast theta changes, isn't that omega? Right, isn't that omega? d theta dt is just delta theta over delta t because it doesn't change. I mean, the rate doesn't change. So uh, it's just omega, okay? And delta theta, when delta theta equals two pi, and the time it takes is big T. So I can write this as negative R sine theta times two pi over T. So that's Vx. Similarly, we can find dy. What's dy equal to? That is dy dt, okay? dy dt. And uh, R sine theta take derivative d dt of sine theta, not cosine theta. And it's very similar. So this time we're getting R times cosine theta. There's no negative sign now. And then d theta dt. We, once again, d theta dt is just omega. Okay, so um, this is R times cosine theta times two pi over the period. Okay, so Vx and Dy. So finally, we're ready to find Ax and Ay so we can, we can combine them. So what's Ax? Ax equals dvx dt, right? We know what vx is. It is r d theta dt uh, minus, it's minus r times two pi over t then sine theta. So uh, I'm gonna take all these constants out. Negative two pi r over t. These are all constants. Then d dt of sine theta, right? Now we know what, two pi r over t is. Two pi r is the circumference t, the time it takes to cover that circumference. So distance over time, isn't that a speed, right? It's just speed, v, negative v. Okay, now d dt of sine theta. What happens when you do that? Once again, it's just like we did before, cosine theta, and then d theta dt, which we know is another two pi over t. Okay, so that's ax. In the meantime, let's find ay, ay equals two dVy over dt and uh, Vy is right here, R times two pi over t times cosine theta. So that is two pi R over t and then ddt of cosine theta, right? Again, two pi over t, we know that, we know that's just V, okay? ddt of cosine theta, you get negative sine theta, d theta dt, which is two pi over t, two pi over t. Okay, so that's AX and AY. Now let's clean things up a little bit. All right, uh, two pi over T, we know that's omega, but usually we don't, we're not given omega, we're given V. What's the difference between omega and V? V is two pi R over T, omega is two pi over T. So the difference is there's an extra R here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move, I'm, I'm gonna multiply this by an extra R here. Then I'm gonna divide it by R. Okay, isn't that the same thing? Now what's two pi over t? That's another v. Sorry about that. That's another v, right? Similarly, I'm gonna do the same thing here. I'm gonna multiply this by r. And I'm gonna divide it by r. And what you see here, here and here, they're both equal to v, okay? There's another v already up front, so that's v squared. So now I can rewrite both x and ay without using any, any t in it, without using an omega in it. I'm just using v and R, those quantities are usually given. So AX equals to what? Negative V squared over R cosine theta. And AY equal to negative V squared over R sine theta. Okay? So that's the, that's the um, um, components A and Y. Therefore the, the vector A is what? AXI plus AYJ. So let's see what that equals to. Now there is a negative V squared over R for both of these. I'm gonna take that out, negative V squared over R. And what's left is cosine theta I plus sine theta J. Uh, what is this folks? What is this? This is a vector which makes an angle theta with the x-axis, isn't it? Because you know that you know normally we write x i plus y j, and uh, that x 
uh, is the x component, and we know x over the over the uh, magnitude e equals cosine theta. And uh, what is the magnitude of this vector here? What is the magnitude of this vector? That would be x squared plus y squared. X is sine theta. I'm sorry, x is cosine theta, y is sine theta. So for this particular vector here, the magnitude equals one because it's cosine theta squared plus sine theta squared, and then you take the square root, okay? So here is what's called a unit vector because the magnitude equals one. And it points uh, at a direction of uh, theta above the x axis. So we're talking about this vector right here. This is the vector. It points along our direction, but it has a unit magnitude. So it's the unit vector R. This is what it is. R with a sharp cap is defined as the vector R divided by its own magnitude. So it points in the same direction as the vector R, but it has a unit, has a magnitude equals, which equals one unit, okay? So I finally found the expression that I'm looking for, for A. A equals to what? Uh, v squared over R. Sorry, I have to write it better that way. V squared over R times what? Negative R, that's the direction, okay? So here is the expression for the centripetal acceleration for something moving in a circle radius R at a constant speed V. Okay, there is an acceleration point to the center of the circle. How do we know it points to the center of the circle? Because the acceleration is along the direction of negative R, negative R right here. Right here. Now, I can, you can see here, R points from O to P, that's R. So negative R points from P back to O. So it points to the center of the circle, okay? And the magnitude is V squared over R. That's clearly the same result as we got in our previous method here. So no matter how you look at it, you find that um, when you do uniform circuit motion, there has to be a component of the acceleration pointing to the center of the circle. In fact, this is the only, only component of the acceleration if the speed is uniform. And that centripetal acceleration has a magnitude of V squared over R. It's got a direction that equals to, that, is, that, that points from the object in circuit motion directly to the center of the circle. That's what we call it centripetal, which means center-seeking acceleration, okay? Um, there are countless applications of circular motion. And uh, even though circular motion is far more prevalent than um, projectile motion, we're gonna, we're gonna actually even study less, we spend less time studying circular motion in chapter four, not because it is not as important as projectile motion. It is in fact more important because we see it every, everywhere. The reason why we don't spend too much time going over circuit motion in this chapter is because we're gonna see a lot more examples of circuit motion embedded in all the chapters from chapter six all the way till the end of this course. So therefore we have plenty of time to study extra examples of circuit motion. So all we have to do now at this point from chapter four is that we realize that for anything to be moving in a circle, there has to be an acceleration point to the center of the circle called centripetal acceleration which equals to V squared over R, we have to know where that comes from. Okay, we use two different ways to derive it. I'm just gonna give, give you one example of the application of centripetal acceleration. And that example is in fact uh, a re, uh, revisit, we're gonna revisit the uh, last example of projectile motion. Remember, um, you have the earth here, okay? You have the earth and then when when a projectile moves fast enough, it's gonna settle into uh, a circular orbit around the Earth so it doesn't fall anymore. So you have, a, you have the Earth right here like this, okay? And the radius of the, of the Earth is R. Now, if a projectile is fast enough, then it simply moves around the Earth like this, right above the surface of the Earth like this. It doesn't fall. And we learned the speed for that to happen was a square root of gr. G is the acceleration of gravity, r is the radius of the Earth. Remember that? Okay, now we spent quite a bit of time going over that problem, right? Uh, we use the approach of, uh, of um, projectile motion. So when a thing falls a certain distance, the Earth's curvature also falls by the same amount. And therefore, it never quite crashed to the surface of the Earth. But guess what? There's a much simpler way to obtain the same result. 
in reality, this thing is no longer doing circular motion. It's doing circular motion. It's, it's not doing projectile motion anymore. It's doing circuit motion, isn't it? Right? It follows the you know, curvature of the Earth, right? And uh, we can ignore the altitude of the satellite so that uh, basically we say it, uh, it's so close to the surface of the Earth that the radius of the orbit is just R, the radius of the Earth. Now, um, you have this thing doing circular motion right here. Anything doing circular motion is subject to a centripetal acceleration, which points the center of the circle. And what is that equal to? Uh, it's AC, okay? AC. Hold on. AC, which is equal to uh, V squared over R, except R here is the radius of the Earth. It's, I mean, it's a little bit more than the radius of the Earth, but it's almost. Okay. Question is who provides the satellite with this acceleration? Well, there is only one object that is responsible for that the Earth. The Earth pulls on the satellite, giving it an acceleration equals, which equals what? G, the acceleration of gravity. Because I'm assuming that the satellite is right above the surface of the Earth, so it's very close to the surface, therefore the acceleration experienced by the satellite is the same as the acceleration experienced by everything else on the surface of the Earth is G, okay? So AC equals G, okay? Gravity is responsible for the centripetal acceleration. And what is that V equal to? Well, V equals the square root of GR. Look at how simple that is. It's incredibly simple, just two steps. You compare with what we got last time, we spent a whole lot of time deriving this stuff. Remember this, okay? Remember this problem, right? You know, we, we, we look at age and equate that age with one half GT squared and we, and we end up with this, we end up with this. Okay, look at how simple it is, right? Get the exact same result, but in two steps here in two steps. So it's remarkable. The answer is the same, of course. And uh, so that's the physics. And that is the reason why the thing never falls. Okay, the satellite never falls. It's not because the Earth doesn't track it. Some people thought, you know, the reason why I'm not falling down anymore is because I'm so far from the Earth, so the Earth doesn't attract me anymore. Well, guess what? If the Earth doesn't attract you, it doesn't provide you with any acceleration, then guess what? Your velocity will not change anymore because there's no acceleration. So there's no change in velocity. So that means what? You are not going to be moving in a circle. Rather, you are just going to go like that. Okay? Because the velocity doesn't change. You know, it doesn't, it do doesn't turn. It doesn't have, you know, it, it has a fixed direction. It keeps on going around. Uh, it, it doesn't keep on going around the Earth. It just leaves the Earth in a straight line, never to return. We know that doesn't happen. Okay? So the Earth still attracts it. But the, the thing is, the acceleration G is not being used for this thing to crash to the surface of the Earth. Rather, it is being used for this thing to do circular motion. You need to go fast enough about a circle so that you need to utilize 100% of that acceleration for circular motion, and there is nothing left for you to uh, crash to the surface of the Earth. Okay, if you don't move or you don't move fast enough, then there is no such need for centripetal acceleration, and you still have that G there, and the end result is that G will, will pull you to the surface of the Earth. Okay, so that is a nifty application of our newly acquired knowledge of centripetal acceleration. And again, you will see tons of examples of circular motion, in, especially in dynamics and also in rotation later. So this is only the beginning of our study of circular motion.